So yeah, my name is Simon Dehan. I'm based in the Netherlands. I am the CTO and co-founder of, of Turn.io. Um, Turn.io is a software as a service company. Um, we've spun out of a nonprofit in South Africa, and the nonprofit is called Prekilt.org. Um, we have a decade-long history of using uh, mostly SMS and similar texting platforms for social good initiatives in areas such as health and education, employment, civic engagement, and, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so since 2017, um, so let me just move some Zoom widgets around the screen so they're not covering my content. So since um, 2017, we've been working with uh, WhatsApp specifically. And uh, Turn is a software as a service tool, like I said earlier, uh, for teams to have personal guided conversations that improve lives at scale. Now, pra practically, what that means is that we help social impact teams scale their work significantly while not being overwhelmed. So the strategy here is, is really quite simple. Uh, we connect teams to their audiences over WhatsApp. We help prioritize the key conversations um, that need most urgent attention, and we help guide those conversations towards outcomes, and then we track whether or not that's actually happening. And so if you're thinking about social impact teams, what kind of teams are that? That's NGOs, nonprofit, uh, social enterprises. Um, in the US, they're called, for example, B Corps, but also very large humanitarian organizations like, for example, the WHO, which I'll be talking about shortly. Now, this started um, and an example organization or initiative that's, that, that uses Turn.io is Mom Connect in South Africa. And that's um, the South African National Department of Health's maternal health program, uh, which we launched as part of a WhatsApp pilot in 2017. So the Department of Health, health in South Africa was needing to be in regular contact with pregnant women. They needed to be able to triage questions coming in and give guidance according to national policy and keep track of the progress being made um, with regards to clinic visits, inoculations, uh, nutrition, and later on early childhood uh, development. Now this started in South Africa, the nonprofit that we've spun out of is also based out of South Africa. So that's why some of our roots are there. And so what this looks like for these kinds of conversations, just to give you an idea is that, for example, we can send people uh, reminders that um, their uh, HIV medicine, the ARVs, are available at a clinic and will help prevent transmission um, of uh, HIV to, uh, to a baby during childbirth. And so that you get all sorts of questions that come back. And so if I, for example, this is a real example, but it's not a real profile picture. Questions that you would get are things like, if I am HIV positive, is it, a, is it possible to breastfeed my child? And so what we do is we, we apply natural language understanding to automatically triage the questions coming in here where we've identified it as a question and then we've matched it with a, an appropriate answer that's come back um, that, uh, that is then immediately sent back to the mother as, as the relevant answer for her question. Some other examples is things like mixed media. So here, here a mother has received some medicine from a clinic and um, they've bought some medicine from a store as well and they're not quite sure how to, how to go about this and we help identify what is this question about. In this case, it's vitamin adherence. And we help the triage process to figure out what is important, what, what needs to be attended to, who's the best person uh, who can answer these questions and just to connect them to a real human in the case of Mom, Mom Connect. <clears throat> now there's very specific things around, for example, behaviors. So um, 10 weeks pregnant, there's some very clear guidance on what you can do. Um, now, this is an example of washing your hands. It relates to maternal health, but I think all of us has, have become fairly experienced over the last six months with regards to the importance of washing hands and, and things like that. And so it's able to track um, um, specific messages that relate to specific behaviors. Again, this is using uh, machine learning models and natural language understanding to just basically do that matching. Another example here is we're sending a reminder and um, with, for a mother where we tell them, hey, your child is so-and-so old, you need to send them or schedule your inoculations or your vaccinations, and this is important why, and this is where you can do it. And then we get a message back that says, hey, we already went to the clinic uh, on the 1st of August, and things are fine. And then we can track that as a, okay, this is clearly a six-week immunization. That step's been 
completed and uh, everything's on track. There's nothing else else needed. So this is what we started with originally in, in South Africa with Mom Connect. It has its roots in SMS and we started introducing that as a pilot uh, with WhatsApp. And um, just out of an anecdote, we were seeing the behavior between SMS and WhatsApp is, an, is an entirely different. Um, immediately when we started allowing WhatsApp, um, and this is hard to comprehend for people in the US, for example, um, but as soon as we started allowing messaging over WhatsApp, we saw that the volume ratio of SMS to WhatsApp was one to 10 immediately, um, which was quite incredible. And so that also informed like, okay, this is a different thing that we've done before than what we've done before. We need different infrastructure to actually uh, address this kind of uh, volume and usage patterns. So that work and building on those experiences, we launched COVID Connect in South Africa, which is the, the world's first COVID-19 hotline for a government on the WhatsApp business API. Um, that reached 500,000 unique users before the official launch, and it has since grown to 8 million um, subscribers. And so this was the, the world's first government uh, COVID-19 hotline where people could receive accurate information on the state of uh, COVID-19 in their country, what the guidance was, all, all that kind of stuff. Now that led, um, and, and that led to our work with the WHO. And, and so with previous work, um, there were, we had a very long standing relationship with the WHO on, on various initiatives. So things came together with Facebook, the WHO and ourselves, and we were asked to help launch the service in pretty much the space of a week. And it was the, it was the world's first launch of this size. And so what made it really pressing was that in the area of COVID-19, misinformation can spread faster than the virus itself. And so when there's a new, entirely new situation, like for example, COVID-19, what we learn, what science knows about it, what the best guidance is can change on a day by day basis. Like I'm based in the Netherlands, the guidance of this past week is different again from the last two weeks, is different again from three months ago. And so having a system out there that's accurate, that people can access and know um, what their latest stats are, what the latest guidance is, what the latest understanding of the virus is, is just extremely important in a global pandemic like we are still finding ourselves in. And so um, the use case is actually quite, quite simple. Um, and for those of you who do have WhatsApp, you can scan the QR code with your uh, WhatsApp client or with your normal iOS camera and it'll, it'll launch the service for you. Um, and um, you can interact with the service and you can get live updated case numbers per country. Um, which is which integrates with the dashboards from John Hopkins and retrieves that information there. Um, you have the latest news relating to COVID-19 um, coming from the WHO. And you've got information on um, basically how to combat misinformation uh, around COVID-19. There's been plenty of that around like what works, what doesn't work, playing in on people's fears and things like that. And so the bot fulfills a, a role there, a, a, a substantial role there um, as well. So yeah, while I'm talking, feel free to interact with the service. Um, it, uh, it should be responsive for you. If not, then, well, you all know what a technical demo is like, so. Cool, so on um, launch day, this is largely what it looked like. Um, and first, there was an announcement by uh, the Director General uh, Tadros, which you can see the first spike there, um, where they announced the service. And then there was a second announcement a few hours later from Mark Zuckerberg, where he posted it on his Facebook page. And apparently, Mark has a lot of followers because immediately that uh, uh, caused quite an increase in messages a second being processed through the system. Now, this is on a single cluster, this graph. We had multiple clusters in various uh, zones around the world to deal with, um, with the traffic. So the story here is about what did it look like to build a service like this in such a short amount of time? What were the tools that worked? What helped? What are our learnings? Um, and hopefully you'll take something away from this talk that, that helps you in your day-to-day -day work. Um, I'm hoping we don't have many more of these global pandemics, um, but uh, where, where these learnings would apply, but I'm sure there's, well, I'm hoping that there's more uh, learnings for you that you 
can take away in your day-to-day -day work as well. So this is the timeline of things. Um, the COVID-19 work started on the 9th of March. Uh, we had a soft launch around the 15th of March, um, which was, to be honest, quite accidental. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then the official launch was on the 18th of March. Now that was the South African version, um, the one that scaled to now about 8 million. Um, the work for the WHO started on the 11th. Um, the WHO infrastructure was ready on the 17th. Um, soft launch was around the 18th, somewhere around there. And the public launch was on the 20th of March. And so um, the infrastructure for the WHO was on AWS. And so part of the work there was not necessarily building the application, but just making sure the infrastructure was up and running and um, ready to go. And so the amazing thing was that 10 million people used the service in just over 48 hours, which is a uh, testament both to the reach of WhatsApp, um, but also of just the tools and the infrastructure and the Elixir uh, and, and the Phoenix framework that really made this possible for us. Um, we were really proud, and still are proud of the service we've built. Um, and this is definitely for us the first time that a service has scaled to these numbers in uh, such a relatively short amount of, of time. And so um, I have an announcement as well. Um, again, this is me playing on one of our learnings around soft launches that I'll elaborate a little bit later. Um, World Mental Health Day is coming up and um, the WHO is launching a service specifically for that. And so given the past experiences of emergencies, everyone knows the mental health and psychosocial support uh, help that's needed in a, in a time of an emergency and, and especially during COVID-19 with everyone either being in quarantine or isolated in some kind of way. The expectation is that the, the need for psychosocial support and mental health support is only going to increase. And so for the WHO, uh, as an extension of the original COVID-19 work we've done, um, we're also launching a digital guide to stress management. Um, and so, again, you can scan the QR code, or if you're already using the service, just type the word breathe, and it'll launch the service for you. Um, and basically, this just takes you through a number of exercises uh, for, um, um, uh, for basically stress management. Um, so you can type um, start, and it'll start your stress management journey and take you through uh, a few days of just basically grounding stress management tools to help you deal with um, anything stress related, which may be partially built on the Elixir stack. Um, this is the first time we're actually building things that are more stateful than we've done before using this infrastructure. And so this is a new thing. Um, and so, yeah, so this hasn't been public. It's been, there's been a few press releases, but it hasn't been, hasn't received a big press pu push yet. So many of you will be seeing this uh, for the first, uh, first time. Um, and I'm hoping that that will be of, of use to, to many people. So the way this is built, and this is, like I said earlier, is a bit of a departure from earlier designs. It's far more stateful. It's more complex. Um, so this is actually our first run with, uh, with this approach. Um, basically, it allows you to inside turn to build um, more uh, threaded sequential interactions, text-based interactions uh, with a service. So you can see on the left, there's a bunch of actions. On the right, there's the, the conversation that's being modeled. Um, all of the other stuff, and I'll touch on that a little bit later as well, all of the other stuff we've done was very stateless, um, and that also made it quite a bit easier to scale. Um, this is the first time that we're, we're doing more stateful things, and so um, we're, we're um, yeah, we're confident it'll hold up, but it's, it's a new piece of technology, and that's always uh, exciting. So the stack is, um, is actually, it, it, it's quite simple. Um, for the WHO, it's just Kubernetes on Amazon Web Services provisioned with Terraform. Uh, we don't have any specific alliance or, or preference for any of these large hosters. Um, Kubernetes still feels very, very academic to us, but it provides a useful base platform 
for deploying, almost treating it like an, an operating system. Um, and it's, it's worked well for us. So we, we don't really have any complaints there. So other than that, it's Postgres 9.6, Elasticsearch, uh, Factory, which is a Q worker, and then Elixir 110.4 um, on OTP 22. Um, and that's, yeah, almost, well, I, I don't know if Elixir is boring, but, but the other ones, certainly Postgres is, is a bit of a boring technology. And we, we really love Postgres. It's, it's extremely solid. It's a very reliable workhorse for the work we've done. It's, it's performed incredibly well. Factory is, a, for those that don't know, and maybe those from the Ruby community would be familiar with Sidekick, the job worker. Uh, Factory is from the same author, and it's a language agnostic fact, uh, job worker um, that works very well with, um, well, certainly we've, we've found it working very well. Digging a little bit further into the stack, we're using obviously Phoenix the web framework and we're using React on the front end. Um, Phoenix is working extremely well for us. We're not doing anything relatively new or fancy there with regards to the new releases stuff. Um, and mostly because a bunch of the code that we've written for this predates that. Uh, and so these are just deployed as Docker containers running the Phoenix app. And then there's a Phoenix, uh, there's a React front end, which is uh, managed and deployed via Netlify. And then we use Absinthe and uh, for GraphQL on the back end and Apollo on the front end. Um, those, uh, that all, all of that communication happens via WebSockets. Data is managed with Data Loader uh, using GraphQL. Arc for storage to either S3 or Google Cloud Storage, depending on the hosting environment we're working on. Um, we're using the combination of Quantum and Highlander to uh, schedule jobs like, for example, cron or recurring jobs. Um, we had an issue at one point where we almost issued a distributed denial of service on ourselves because it was quite difficult at times to limit the amount of processes that Quantum ran on a schedule to just a single node in a, in a cluster. Um, but Highlander has solved that beautifully for us. So if you're looking for a way to combine jobs running on a schedule in a clustered environment, but you only want it running on one node at a single time, Highlander will really, really help you there. Uh, we're using a library called X-Rated just for rate limiting on all API endpoints and Factory Worker X to, to, job, to talk to the Factory job server. Um, the stack itself, what it looks like, it's um, we have the load balancer, which is generally provided by the hosting environment. Um, SSL and all that stuff is terminated there. Then um, the Phoenix app, which is really just, you know, it's just a straight up normal Phoenix app. There's nothing really special about it. Those are all auto scaled within limits based on CPU thresholds using Kubernetes and then um, automatically clustered with, uh, with libcluster using the Kubernetes strategy. So that works, that works extremely well for us. And both uh, the factory workers and the Phoenix app are all joined in one big cluster. Um, uh, yeah. So then the WhatsApp business API for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, it's basically a number of Docker containers that you need to run to that take care of all of the end-to-end -end encryption and things like that. Um, and for us, for the WHO, we run this with 32 shards on the WhatsApp business API. And there's the, a bunch of stateful services like factory server, Elasticsearch, and, and Postgres. Now, this stack was replicated in multiple zones around the world to ensure load balancing. And as many of you know, or maybe you already have, have, have seen that the QR code um, actually just points at a URL. And so WhatsApp conversations can be started with a URL. And what we did was we used a bit.ly link to round robin between different clusters to, to spread the load. So if you open the link, you first went to a uh, essentially a, a serverless cloud function, which then handpicked one of the various clusters around the world and assigned you to that one, um, which helped us manage the load across these various, uh, various installations for the launching of the service. So things that worked, um, and I think for us, what's, what's really impressed us is just the ease of clustering of beam nodes. Um, 
look, many of you are working with Elixir or have been working with Elixir for, I don't know how many years already. This is probably old news. Um, we come from a Python background. And so Turn.io is our team's first production Elixir environment. And some of these things that were like really hard problems in Python just don't exist in El Elixir. And, and so it's simple things like publishing web sockets via GraphQL subscriptions from any Beam, mode, Beam node is just so easy. It's, it just feels almost unfair if you're coming from an environment that doesn't have that clustering idea built in. And so subconsciously, there's like a whole set of problems that you're almost inclined to not even approach simply because the language doesn't allow that for you or the underlying infrastructure doesn't allow that for you. And so for us, working with Elixir in many ways feels magical, not in a bad magical, like code magical way, but just like, wow, there's like this whole new world of opportunities that we previously weren't really thinking about that now are available to us, um, which is really quite incredible. So um, the other thing that, really worked well is network control. So we've stopped worrying about processes. Turn.io is a heavily networked application. Some of our earlier Python applications, we had things like long running network connections were often problematic and forced us to make things asynchronous. And then if you're asynchronous, if you're running things asynchronous, then you introduce a whole bunch of other different problems like back pressure or rate limiting that just become difficult because you still need to communicate between these various systems. And so Elixir has just, as a language, has really just made that, uh, those problems much, much simpler for us to reason about. And it feel like we, we, it gives us a really good set of tools to manage those problems. Um, the other thing that worked well is monitoring. Now this is not specifically Elixir, I guess, but there's some really great libraries and the, and the Beam uh, VM allow, really allows you to introspect your processes very well. So, uh, if you're going to run things at scale or high volume, really invest in your monitoring and your observability. Um, so Prometheus and Grafana are, are invent, immensely valuable and we really highlight upcoming problems. And we use Zipkin to, to just get insights into delays when they happened. Um, and parts of turn are pretty distributed as I was showing earlier. And so being able to see which, which, li which code paths are slow, um, Zipkin really highlighted that to us. Now, on top of that, with Prometheus and Grafana, escalation through pager duty just was, yeah, it was very straightforward, worked extremely well. Um, automation worked well. Um, again, many of these things are, are, are if you are, are almost, um, I don't know, just very simple if you mention them, but the, these, are, these are still the kinds of learnings that you do uh, when you build a system like this or learnings that you, you, you get. So if you're running a small team, really invest in automating as much as possible. Um, the value of a good uh, CI CD setup really compounds over time. So at, at our team size at launch was really tiny. Right now we're about seven developers, I think. Um, but really automation, it, it felt like it added another team member to our team or a number of team members that we didn't have to worry about whether our deploys were going through. We didn't have to worry about versioning things. Um, and so many of the things that historically I would have a team for to do, automation and the tools that are, are available now just, just didn't require that. So right now production releases are built and deployed within three minutes of a tagged commit. Um, QA releases are built and deployed on each commit. Um, as a result of automation, our deploys are smaller and less stressful as a result. Feature flags. Identify the things that you can live without and make it easy to turn them off. So um, for launch, we disabled live el Elasticsearch indexing. And this is a thing that, it's both a thing that worked well and that didn't work well. So we disabled media support. We kept everything within the service as stateless as possible. And um, yeah, for feature flags, Elixir's pattern matching made this very easy in the code base. Like there's specific things, we don't want this to happen. Set a flag, skip that code path entirely, and then just continue. So that, that's what allowed us to disable Elasticsearch very easily. Um, so I'll touch a little bit more on Elasticsearch later. Um, load test. Let me just check how I'm doing on time. Good. So load test all the critical paths extensively. 
um, make it easy to do so repeatedly so that you can actually track the effect of the changes that you're making. Again, these things are very logical, but if you're under stress and you're needing to deploy a thing within a couple of days for a global audience, these are the things that you likely will forget to do, but do need to pay attention to. So we load tested the application to 1,800 requests a second, which was more on, on a cluster, which is more than our more than double our expected maximum. So with that, we ensured that the response times remained below 100 milliseconds. We used loader.io to run those load tests. Um, factory, I touched on it earlier. The job server has been extremely reliable for us. Um, on one of our clusters, it's processed 1.7 billion events. Um, historically, we would have defaulted to something like RabbitMQ, but factory gives us retries with ex exponential backoff out of the box, which is extremely convenient. I know you can build these things on RabbitMQ and it, it'll work well. It's just one of those things that we now didn't need to build. Um, and so our, uh, our, our <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very grateful for Factory and the, and the team that, that did that. So now some things that did not work. Um, again, this, we touched on that a little bit earlier, the feature flags. So Elasticsearch is really, it's a great piece of software, but in our experience, it's, it's difficult to run from an operational perspective. So we are confident we could, could have done it, but we didn't want to have to focus on that. And so we disabled it for launch. Again, so um, it's, it's kind of a, a what worked and what didn't work combination here. Um, it's just one of those things, if you don't need to worry about it, don't worry about it for launch and make sure you could turn it back on when you do need it. Um, what, other, other things that didn't work was half automated things. So um, it's stuff like, well, I mean, I say this quite, a, and I've heard other people say it as well, just broken gets fixed, but shitty lasts forever. Um, some operational things were not automated the way they should have been in Terraform. And there are no squeaky clean production environments. It just does not exist. Certainly if you're not under a massive time uh, pressure to deliver something because there's a global pandemic. Um, but, but that said, you, one can certainly work towards making sure things are not messy. Um, the reality is that some things will always be messy in a production system and it's, it's really hard to detangle those things. So right now, six months in, we're still trying to detangle some of the shortcuts that we took, uh, with regards to deployments that, um, um, yeah, that, that aren't as, that aren't working in the way that we would like them to work. Um, so yeah, if you can avoid half automating things, then, then do so. Sometimes it's better not to automate them and, and then bite the bullet and do it well, uh, than doing it half, because if you're doing it half, it's always going to last longer than you would expect. Um, some learnings. Soft launches are vital. Um, and this is kind of, this was accidental to be honest. Um, so I'm saying here, we always made sure that we were seeing high volumes before any major public launches. In a way, that's true for every single launch except for the first one. Uh, the first one was an accident where a Department of Health representative tweeted about services pre-launch. Um, what that did was that basically it gave us about 24 hours to stress test the system and see that it's actually working, observe it in production, before actually any media attention was focused on it. And so you will really help your team to do this because it really relieves the stress of big bang launches. Um, soft launches are vital. So everyone who's now testing our stress guidance on the WHO service, thank you very much. If there's bugs, you're helping us catch them before actually going uh, live globally. The other thing that's, that we've learned, certainly for first launches, keep things simple. Now, everyone knows this, everyone repeats it. It's hard to do in production uh, in, in real life use cases. Reality is that simple applications are just way much easier, way easier to scale. So we only launched with a single language, zero stateful interactions. It was just keyword response things. No media support and no search index because we turned that off. Um, there were quite a number of other services that launched um, during the same time, national services, government services, regional services, pretty much all of them suffered a significant amount of downtime simply because they couldn't keep up with the load or they weren't prepared. Uh, the WHO service was the, the largest one at launch 
of any of them and was also the only one that stayed up the whole time. For a large part, that is extremely well for us. Phoenix worked extremely well. But part of that is also just strategy, like keep your application simple. The other thing is plan for surges. We, we defaulted to being at 5% of capacity at all times. So traffic tends to be quite bursty as a result of television coverage or social media activities. Um, having capacity at 5% gave us the headroom where we could scale up where, where needed just to deal with, with the surges in, in demand. Um, in a way, this is spare capacity could feel like a waste. The other side, the spare capacity made sure we were able to scale up and provide a um, valuable service to, to people in a hopefully once in a century global pandemic. Um, the other thing is um, ask for help. We're, we're a very small team and we really needed help to pull this off. And so there's a, a huge amount of credit goes to the team of experts at both Amazon Web Services and WhatsApp who worked alongside us for the biggest installation of th this WhatsApp business API at launch. So the way, practically what this looked like is that we had multiple WhatsApp groups open, constantly open Zoom calls and exchanging insights while we were all observing the system and how it worked. Um, so yeah, ask for help. If, even if you're an expert in a field, um, still ask for help. Don't, don't go for it, for it solo. Now, the other thing is, um, I think there's a huge, there's a really big thank you that, that we are constantly wanting to express uh, as a team. So when this was going on and, and you all saw the timeline, it was just a couple of days. We didn't have a lot of time to prepare this. And so we sent out an email to a number of smaller teams with the ask to be on standby should help be necessarily. Mostly just saying, hey, you know, you're delivering this piece of software or you're responsible for this piece of software or you're part of the team that manages this. Um, and it's a critical piece of infrastructure for the world's first global response to the COVID pandemic on WhatsApp. Um, would you please be, at least be aware of the fact and um, make yourself available should anything uh, break or, or need, uh, need attention? And so this was part of, our, of us helping, reaching out for help in, in the community. And it was incredible. Everyone showed up within 24 hours. So this is really just a testament to the Elixir community. Um, many of you, I suppose, in, in many ways as well. So our, for, for this launch, our, we, we really just wanna say a really big thank you for, to Dashbit for the Elixir advice. Um, Jose jumped on a call, the team helped out, did some reviews, gave some advice on how we could optimize things. Sentry for the error reporting tools, um, we couldn't have done it without that. Contrib Sys for the factory job worker, 1.7 billion events on a single cluster is not a small number. Um, and the team at RASA for, uh, for the natural language under, under understanding. Now, further than that, also the Elixir community, just for all the tooling that made this possible, the various clients we're using for various things, rate limiting, all of the stuff that all of this relies on, Phoenix, Ecto, Elixir itself, which just released 1.11, uh, which we're very excited about. So for all of you who are involved in open source and the Elixir community, um, many of you have contributed in significant ways to making this a success, a global first on a, in a global response to a once in the century, hopefully uh, global pandemic to, to make sure that reliable um, information was available in people's hands over WhatsApp. And so, yeah, thank you for everyone who's involved in that. Uh, we know that many of you do this on your personal time as open source developers. And um, yeah, just know that it's, it's really valued and um, it, it made this a success. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you. If you're interested in this kind of work, using tech for good for social impact, then I would recommend you join our monthly town hall meeting where, we, where there's a larger community of social impact organizations and humanitarian organizations doing work like this. Uh, and mostly just discussing how can we use chat systems for, for, for social good. So thank you for your time. Um, there's a few minutes left, I think, for questions. Thank you so much, Simon. It's a great talk, They're really inspiring. Um, can you, um, I, I actually have a question myself. Um, 
and it's wh where, yeah, how do you actually do your stress testing? How do we do the stress testing? What, what tools Great do question. you use, yes. Uh, we use the tool called loader.io. Many of the interfaces for the WhatsApp business API, at the end of, like the critical paths all involve essentially just HTTP APIs. And so it was quite easy just to construct the kind of requests that we were getting using uh, the stress testing tool. Um, and we, we made sure that everything that we stress tested hit all of the paths that we were worried about. Database access, queuing uh, to the server, job working, get a response, and return the response back to the HTTP request. And so that's how we stress tested it. Um, yeah, what, what numbers it was pretty hit? straightforward. Sorry? What numbers were you able to hit? In throughput? We stress tested it to 1,800 requests a second on a single cluster. OK, brilliant. OK. okay. Um, now we have a question from Celeste. Um, Celeste, are you, if you're there, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, hi, thanks. Um, I actually had two questions. The first one, uh, just very general about the organization. You said you were sure. a public benefit corporation, so I was wondering where the funding comes from for this project? Mm -hmm. So, um, for us, um, we are a public benefit corporation. That means we are a for-profit, but with a very strong mission lock for what we do. Um, so for us, we have a normal software as a service platform where we have clients that pay on a monthly basis. So that's, that's that. Other than that, for many of these government things and the WHO launches and others, um, a lot of that uh, funding was mostly all just for the infrastructure, basically just hosting costs and no other costs were uh, involved there at all. And the hosting costs were, um, for many of the governments were from philanthropic funds that made it available um, or uh, tech providers that were willing to assist and, and cover those costs. Okay, interesting, just to follow up. Um, what's an example of a paid customer then? What's an example of a paid customer? Um, let me think. Uh, a paid customer would be like Sesame Workshop, um, doing early childhood development, or um, paid customers would be ones working in the space of agriculture, um, giving access to um, uh, agricultural information, say, for example, in East Africa with uh, the problem with the locusts, the locust plague there, um, or other commercial education, early childhood development practitioners uh, across East, uh, East and West Africa. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it gives me a better picture, thank you. And the second cool. question I had was, um, you spoke about the importance of having a good CI, CD um, set up, that it adds, it's like adding an employee. Yeah. Um, for me personally, I've worked more for startups that are quite small, and I've actually never seen a good CI, CD environment that's um, working well for people. So could you um, maybe give an example of the tech that you use um, that helps sure. that? Sure. So, um, well, um, what we're doing here is basically uh, everything goes through Circle CI just to make sure tests pass. If tests pass, uh, it'll get handed over to, um, in many cases, uh, it's Google Cloud Builder. So Google Cloud Builder will then build a um, Docker uh, image for that build, essentially. And then um, when that is all happy and passes, <clears throat> Google Cloud Builder will then run the necessary kube control uh, commands to automatically deploy it to the various clusters. And so the, for the QA environment, the turnaround that time on that is pretty much, well, how fast are your tests and how fast can you build your Docker image? Uh, and then really reducing the times there really depends on are you caching the things that you want to cache to make sure not everything is rebuilt the whole time. Um, so it's pretty straightforward for us, at least at the moment. Um, Netlify allows us to do things like uh, deploy previews on pull requests, which means um, you can see the actual front end application interact with it on a 
uh, on a deploy that's done specifically for that pull request. Uh, and so it just gives us immediate feedback on the work that's being hap that's being done on the front end. Um, and that front end then connects to the, the QA environment that we're running. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, that answers it perfectly. Thanks. Cool. Okay, thank you, Celeste. Now we have a question from Morten Nilsson. Morten, if you're there, uh, can you mute yourself? Yes, I can unmute myself. So you're here. Uh, good. So uh, I'm just curious about uh, tech depth. So you mentioned some shortcuts that you took early on uh, in yeah. production. And uh, I mean, there are two things that can happen when you take uh, shortcuts early on. So either you pay your interest, I mean, you have incidents and you lose a lot of time, that's why it's annoying. Uh, but they can also grow. Like, would it be many of those things, have they just been annoying, but it's as easy to fix them now as it was back then? Or have they sort of been entangled? And like, do you have some of these examples that would be like, oh, it would have been so easy to fix this six months ago, but now it's almost impossible to fix? Yeah, we're not at that stage yet. So it's not like it's not we're not at the point where things are not reversible. Um, and and I think that's like the kind of like the dangerous threshold you want to be avoiding. Like um, it is is the tech debt we're incurring? Is it still reversible? Like, am I in debt for life or is this a painful study debt I'm trying to get rid of quickly? Because I think the ability to take on debt even in life is is a privilege, right? It, it allows you to do things but then you need to do it in a controlled fashion and manage that risk. Um, and so I think, so some examples, I think um, our first deploys didn't use Terraform at all. Um, it was just a combination of, oh, I don't know, either manual or uh, uh, running cube control from one of our uh, laptops, uh, um, which very much like limited it to like individual person's machines which felt risky. Um, and then we started moving towards Terraform and specifically Terraform Cloud. But then the amount of clusters we needed to deploy for this setup was growing faster than our ability to automate things with Terraform. And so you ended up with this thing, yeah, that cluster, we haven't gotten around yet to actually automate fully with Terraform the way that we want to. And so you end up with this thing like, okay, I need to deploy this change there in terms of infrastructure, but how is that managed? And so it like it adds to you like your, in a way like your your cognitive weight in trying to reason about your application, what what is managed, how and where. And so I think that's what you want to avoid. So um, it's like that thing, like I said earlier, like broken gets fixed. If you can't deploy it all, I'm sure you'll fix it. You know, it's top priority. Um, if it's shitty it's going to last longer than you want. And you really want to make sure that you detangle that as soon as possible. So we're still in the process of detangling some of those things. Our Terraform setup now is much better than it was three months ago, but we're not completely out of the woods yet. We're still repaying some of that debt. 